Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insight straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions. Regardless of whether you apply to a particular school being highlighted in a given episode, you should listen to all of them, as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process, prompting you to come up with your own follow-up questions for when you visit campus or meet with a college admissions representative yourself. Don't forget to visit our website, www.collegeadmissionstalk.com, or the show notes of each episode to access the alphabetical list of all the colleges available with the related audio link to the right of each school. The alphabetical list provides you with on-demand access to all of the episodes so that you may listen whenever you wish. And if you want to receive links to episodes before they are released on the podcast, along with other related resources, please fill out the email opt-in form also available on our website and in the show notes of each episode. Lastly, please email me with any questions or comments at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome back today Amy Chung, who's the Associate Director of Admissions at Boston College. Amy, thank you so much for coming back. How are you today? Thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be back. I'm doing well. Fantastic. And we're so happy to have you. Amy, by the way, did episode 16, which was launched back on March 21st of 2022. So Amy, have there been any changes in your application review process since we last met? Yeah, there hasn't been really anything significant that has changed in our review process. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about Boston College as we move forward. Um, I will say there surely are changes, I'm, I'm positive, coming down the pike as we have just recently gotten the Supreme Court's decision based on race-based admission processes. Uh, I think everyone's kind of in a holding pattern right now looking what that might particularly look like. So no new information to share, but I'm sure there'll be some changes. Um, though probably relatively minute. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Amy. And can you provide us with a brief overview of Boston College and what makes it unique among other universities? Sure. Yeah. Boston College is a really special place. And I know I'm I'm biased when I share that. (laughs) Um, We are a Jesuit Catholic university. We're located in Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts, which is actually right on the outskirts of Boston. Uh, We're on the city limits and about five miles away from what folks probably picture in their head as Boston. We're also a mid-sized university with about 9,400 undergraduate students, and we're lucky to be both a liberal arts university, which encourages our students to explore a depth and breadth of knowledge, but also to be a tier one research university, to be a division one athletic community, and to have a space where our students are incredibly engaged outside of the classroom as well. Uh, I think it's always such a challenging question about what makes a university unique among others, because there are so many amazing schools out there that provide amazing things. I will say as a Bostonian myself, uh, the location is just something that is so special that only we hold. Being able to have a beautiful campus where students live and learn, we are mainly a residential campus, while also having such easy access to the city and all the opportunities that come with internships and research opportunities, but also the fun of being in Boston, the museums, <laughs> the concerts, the sporting events. Um, so our students really do have the best of both worlds in that way. Well, your location is absolutely terrific. Obviously, being in the city of Boston, like you said, there are so many opportunities recreationally, but also for research opportunities and internships. You mentioned you're a liberal arts school, tier one research facility, and of course, you're engaged students on and off campus. And I'm repeating all of this, Amy, because I recently read that your retention rate or the percentage of first year students who return is an astonishing 95% which is well over the national average of approximately 69%. 
So Amy, what is the secret to keeping so many students happy once they're on your campus and wanting to come back year after year? Sure. Yeah. So I don't think it's a secret, right? I think we are incredibly <laughs> lucky uh, to have a community here that is unlike any other I've ever been a part of. I think a lot of that comes naturally by the types of students that we're engaging with and the students that we're attracting based on our Jesuit identity. But a lot of it is really intentional, right? Our The Jesuit mission really revolves around mentorship and conversation partners and growth of the entire person. And so I think not only are our students challenged and engaged in the classroom, especially during their first year, but they're asked questions about who they are and who they want to be. And I think that really engages them on this journey that they have at, at BC. And certainly uh, we have the most amazing faculty and staff, right? Our, our faculty teach at Boston College to challenge our students academically, but also um, because they want to mentor these students. They want to engage with them. Um, and our staff, at all of the different resources that we have from the Office of First Year Experience to student affairs that provide amazing resources for students to deal with the transition to college, which can be difficult no matter where a student lands. So you mentioned your Jesuit mission, your engaged students, and of course your faculty who serve as mentors to those students. So I was wondering what qualities or characteristics does Boston College look for in prospective students? Yeah, I think every every school is looking for students who are academically prepared, right? Students who have the foundation to find success in the classroom while still being challenged academically. But beyond that, uh, for us, we're looking for students who are passionate, right? That's really what I look for when I read applications because there are so many incredible students that do amazing things. I want to see students who are passionate about the things that they're doing because that's what's going to carry them into this next chapter, whether they're doing the same activities or they're branching out and expanding their horizons, their passion, their curiosity, right? Students, it's easy. Well, I shouldn't say it's easy, I guess, but it's relatively <laughs> easy to be intelligent, right? We all know things. We all have skills. Uh, we all are able to take in different information, but to be curious, to want to learn more, to want to dive deeper, those are the types of students we're looking for. Excellent. And Amy, could you walk us through the general application process at Boston College, including important deadlines, requirements, and frankly, anything else you wish to share with our listeners? Sure. Sure. So I would say, you know, our, our review process, I'm sure you hear this over and over again, especially if you're a regular listener of the podcast, but we have a holistic <laughs> review process, right? We want to get to know our students as more than just the grades they've received in the classes that they've taken. Of course, that's a core component of it. I, I just shared, you know, we want our students to have the foundation to be successful at BC, um, but we also want to make sure that you know, they're engaged in a variety of different ways. And so we try to gauge all of this through the common application. That's how most of our students will choose to apply. We are a QuestBridge partner school. So if I have any QuestBridge scholars listening, uh, you certainly can apply and rank Boston College through the national college match. But the vast majority of our students come in through the common applications, the only other way to apply to Boston College. An important note for us is that we have only early decision one and two and regular decision. We do not offer an early action option. So if you're applying early to Boston College, as a reminder, early decision is that binding deadline. You're saying, I'm in love with Boston College. It's my <laughs> one and only. If I'm admitted, I'm committing to attend. It's a big commitment for our students to make. Those deadlines for early decision are on November 1st and January 2nd. We do also have a non-binding option for you to apply through regular decision, get your admission decision from us and any other schools you're applying to, get those financial aid packages and decide by May 1st where you'd like to attend. Our regular decision deadline is also on January 2nd. So there are a couple of different options to apply based on your level of interest in Boston College and the other schools that you have in the mix through the application process. Well, we appreciate the overview of the different types of methods to apply. You mentioned ED, regular decision, and of course, there's no early action. You also talked about your holistic review, which you're right, we hear a lot about throughout the podcast episodes and how it's more than just grades. So let's unpackage the overall applications just a little further. The transcript, Amy, obviously the most important piece of the academic portion of the overall application. Can you share with us what are you looking for when reviewing a student's transcript? And do you recalculate the given GPA or do you use the GPA provided as part of your overall review? 
It's a great question. I think one of the most nuanced parts of the process uh, is every school looks at transcripts a little bit differently. We do not recalculate your GPA at BC, but at the same time, we don't go just off of the GPA that's reported from your high school. I think a GPA is helpful and it shows um, you the context of where you fall within your school, but also what we really do in our review process when we look at your transcript is take a look at each individual course you've taken, your performance in each individual course. We're really looking for students who not only have found success in the courses that they've taken, but have kept their foot on the gas, right? Have continued to challenge themselves. And we know that everyone has different strengths and weaknesses and not everyone is going to be at the pinnacle level in every single subject area. We're just looking for you to continue that challenging progression, right? To take the appropriate next step and not just coast by. We wanna make sure that you, again, have that curiosity, right? You want to see what's next. You wanna keep diving into that academic coursework. Um, so that's really what we're looking for. And I would say the way we evaluate the transcript overall, while we do see that GPA, whether your school reports weighted or unweighted or both, we're also diving deeper into that transcript and saying, what courses have you taken? What does that progression look like? And what grades have you received in those courses? Well, that's fantastic. Thank you, Amy. And digging deeper in the overall application, what advice do you have for students in terms of crafting a compelling essay? Great question. One of the most popular questions I think we hear from <laughs> students, because I think students feel like this is the part they can control, right? All of the other things they've been working on, they've been controlling it over time, the classes that they've taken, what they've been involved in. But as you sit down and really begin your essays, this is the part of your college application that you have complete ownership over. Uh, it's certainly a component for us. Uh, we want to get to know you. These are the places in the application process that we get to know about who you are in narrative form from your own voice. So that's really meaningful. And these are the places I think you can share your passions with us, share what makes you who you are. Um, and so I think my biggest piece of advice, and I know no student likes this advice, so I think they'll listen to this, <laughs> probably roll their eyes and that's okay, but just be you, be authentic. Share about the things that you care about. Don't write an essay because you think it's what we want to hear. Write an essay because it's something you want to share with us. That leaps off the page when we read your application. Well, that is great advice. And there's multiple parts to the application. The transcript obviously is going to give you the academic portion of what the student was able to do or not while in high school. The activity sheet, which we'll get to in a second, talks about what you did after school. But that essay students, when a college admissions rep reads it, if they haven't learned anything new about you, then go back to the drawing board. That's the goal of the essay, to give them something different that they don't necessarily find so easily off your transcript or your activity sheet. So we appreciate that, Amy. And speaking of the rest of the application, are there any specific extracurricular activities or experience that Boston College values and considers in the admissions process? It's a great question. And I think students often want to know what is going to look best on their application. <laughs> How do I best use my time to stand out? And I know, again, it's really similar to the essay and being authentic to who you are, but do the things that you're passionate about. I always tell students I would be exceptionally sad if you spent four years of your life trying to impress me, <laughs> right? Spend four years of your life doing the things that you love, that help you develop, that help you grow, that help you make connections. Um, so there's not one particular or a set of particular experiences or extracurricular activities that we value more so than others. We want to see you engaged in the things that you're passionate about, the things that mean a lot to your life, right? I know that oftentimes we'll have students that work part-time jobs or translators for their families, right? These are things that I don't even want to say obligations, but needs that you fill in your community, in your family. Um, so we want to see those things, right? It doesn't have to fit a certain category or a certain um, area for it to be valuable to us. I think often schools are looking for students who align with their mission. You'll often hear that kind of described as finding institutional fit, which I think is a a kind of wishy-washy term, but really <laughs> aligning with our mission, aligning with our community. Uh, and so there's not one particular area that you have to engage in, right? Obviously, service is a Jesuit component. We're not necessarily looking for students who have X number of service hours. We're looking for students who become leaders and mentors in their activities, no matter what those activities are. That's how we're really seeing that institutional alignment. Well, we appreciate the overview and insight. And of course, another piece are recommendation letters. So Amy, what role do recommendation letters play in the application review? 
And is it better to have letters from teachers or other individuals? What could you share with us? For sure. So at BC, uh, we do require two recommendations from teachers and one from your school counselor. And really what we're trying to get to the heart of in these recommendations is who you are as part of your community, what your work ethic is like, what your character is like, how others kind of perceive you in the community. And so that's really helpful for us to have. We certainly know that our students are engaged in other areas. They might have advisors or bosses or coaches that would write them really strong letters. I always say if we can learn something new about you through an additional letter of recommendation, we're always happy to read that. But be mindful um, of the fact that there's a lot of reading going on, right? And so (laughs) I know there are probably many people that could speak very highly of you, but we want to learn new information from any additional recommendations. I will also say we don't require anything in particular based on your major, right? If you're applying to a science program, we don't require a recommendation from a science teacher specifically, but some schools might have a little bit more nuance in what they require. So just asking admission counselors, reading on the websites, what is going to put you in the best position for each individual school. Well, I appreciate you mentioning that again, if you're going to be a science major, you don't necessarily have to have a recommendation letter from the science teacher. And of course, it's always great to reach out to you in your office or of course, check your website. And by the way, Amy, I always put the Office of Undergraduate Admissions in the show notes. If there are any other links you want to provide the students and parents, send it to me. And of course, we'll make it available in the show notes. Now, I know that BC is also test optional. Amy, would you be able to share with us the percentage of students that apply without submitting their test scores, but also the percentage that was actually admitted? Absolutely. Yeah, this varies a little bit year to year. And what we've seen from our test optional um, policies in the few years that we've had them. And so please just know that this could change over time. Um, But over the last few years, it's seen approximately 60% of our students apply without test scores. Um, And for our enrolled classes without test scores, they've been about 50-50. 50% have submitted and 50% have not. Um, So students can certainly be competitive candidates without their test scores. I know that this is such a hard thing to wrap your head around if you're not in the process of reviewing applications, but I truly mean it when we say, If your test scores are there, that's one of the factors in that holistic review process. If your test scores are not there, it's not a factor that we're considering. It's as simple as that. Well, we appreciate that. And it's a message to students that certainly prepare for the SAT, ACT, take both. Obviously, do your best. If you fall within that mid-50 or higher and that score represents who you are as a student, my advice would be submit. If it's lower, then you should rest assured that you have the option not to submit. Correct, Amy? Absolutely. Yeah, I always tell students, if you open that score report, I age myself, I say you open that envelope and pull out the score report. I'm sure they're (laughs) downloading this on an online portal. But if you look at those scores, you say, yes, that's a great representation of who I am. And it aligns with those averages at the schools you're interested in. That might be a really good indicator to submit. If those scores don't excite you, they don't make you feel like, yeah, that's who I am as a student then maybe it's best not to submit them, right? You get to put your best foot forward as you review um, what schools are looking for and what you'd like to submit as part of your application process. Well, it's great advice and insight. I particularly appreciate how you shared the data, which by the way, is pretty consistent amongst most colleges and university. You said approximately 60% apply without submitting their test scores. And in terms of the students that are enrolled, it's somewhere at the 50-50 range, which again, is pretty consistent right now. So, Amy, are there any specific financial aid or scholarship opportunities available for prospective students? And how can students and their parents best navigate the financial aspect of attending Boston College? Absolutely. I think this is one of the most challenging pieces of the college application process and one that weirdly gets overlooked, right? We think about college admission and we don't think about college financial aid, which college is such an investment and I think a well worth it investment, but certainly one you have to plan for, right? The price of college is exponentially increasing. And so we're truly blessed at Boston College to be one of 21 colleges and universities in the country that practice need blind admission and meet 100% of your demonstrated need. So what that essentially means is that we are looking at a couple of different forms. We'll require both the FAFSA, which is the federal form, and the CSS profile, which is a form run through the College Board that gives us a little bit more information about your financial standing. Our financial aid office will look at those. They will determine from those forms what your expected family contribution is. You'll often hear that referred to as your EFC. 
we'll look at the overall cost of attendance at Boston College and subtract that expected family contribution. And what's left is your demonstrated need. We are committed to meeting 100% of that need through scholarships, grants, loans, and work study. Sometimes what we estimate in our forms find is your expected family contribution might align perfectly with what you and your family have budgeted, but forms don't capture everything, right? So there might sometimes be a discrepancy there. I really encourage students and their families to utilize the net price calculator. Every single school is required to have a net price calculator on their website. Some, I will say, are better than others, right? Our financial aid (laughs) office is really committed to making sure ours is accurate. They share with us that if it's given appropriate information and nothing drastically changes between your estimate and the time you're filing for financial aid, it should be within about 90% accuracy of what your financial aid package will look like at Boston College. So I always recommend you utilize that to get a sense and to have those conversations as you move forward, especially because we are very driven by need-based aid. With this incredible, uh, generous need-based aid policy, we are really focused on our need-based aid. We do have one opportunity for a merit-based scholarship. It's our Gabelli Presidential Scholars Program. It is a four-year full tuition scholarship. It's typically granted to about 18 students each year, so it's incredibly selective. There is no separate application process for that. You need to apply to Boston College by November 1st in order to be considered. You do not need to be an early decision candidate. You certainly can be and be considered as you'll apply by November 1st if you apply early decision one, but you can select regular decision on the common application, which is that non-binding deadline, and submit by November 1st to be considered for that program and for that full scholarship. We are also Division I athletics, so we do have athletic scholarships for athletes available, and we're happy to apply any private scholarships that you might have from your community, from your job, things of that nature. Um, But here at BC, very primarily focused at need-based aid. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned the Gabelli Scholarship and so much more, in particular the net price calculator, which, as you said, every school needs to provide one. Usually it's on their website and quite frankly, easy to find if you just do a Google search, net price calculator, Boston College or whatever school, and you'll find it. And that's another conversation that comes up a lot in terms of parents and students not having the financial conversation early, right? We never want to hear of a student who's accepted to their top choice school only to find out that they can't afford it. So again, students, parents, very important to have these conversations often and early, but also use the net price calculator for any colleges that uh, you're interested in. So we appreciate that again. And Amy, what resources or support does Boston College provide to help students transition from high school to college, especially for those students who may have had an IEP or perhaps a 504 plan while they were in high school? Absolutely. I think this goes back to our conversation about the retention rate in the first year and that 95% of our students are staying from year one to year two. Um, We have so many resources. We have a full office of the first year experience, really committed to making sure students know what they need, know what questions they need to ask, and maybe answer some of those questions before they even know that they have them um, to provide mentorship and resources and to help them transition to life as a Boston College student. We certainly have amazing resources for students with developmental disabilities, learning differences, physical disabilities. Um, Our Office of Disability Services is incredible in the accommodations that they're able to provide. Um, I can provide that link actually to their website because they have a full list of the different accommodations that are available at Boston College. My biggest piece of advice in terms of this for our students who might be listening that have an IEP or a 504 plan or have accommodations at their high school level, there's a lot more advocacy that comes at the college level, both at Boston College and most other colleges and universities, because you're transitioning into that adult responsibility. So there are accommodations there for you at almost every college and university. You got to ask for them, right? You got to be able to say, this is something that I need or I need help. I don't know what those accommodations look like. Can you walk me through that process? Whereas in high school, maybe your parents or your counselors are kind of starting that conversation. It's gonna The onus is going to be on you to start that conversation at the college level. So just keep that in mind. But there are amazing people on every college campus that are there to help you. Well, that's great advice and certainly something to keep in mind, students. You certainly have to advocate for yourselves once you're on campus and even throughout the college process. And of course, yes, give me that link and I'll put it in the show notes. 
Amy, what unique opportunities or programs do you offer for students to engage in research, internships, or even study abroad experiences at Boston College? Yes, I think experiential learning is becoming more and more popular throughout the college experience generally. And it really goes to our Jesuit mission of educating the whole person, making sure students are not only learning in the classroom, can apply that learning and are learning to grow as people and humans and community members as well. So there's certainly a lot of opportunities right here on our campus. As I mentioned earlier, we are a tier one research university. So there is a lot of research and a lot of funding for research going on right on our campus. So that's another amazing way to create connections with your professors and to engage in um, incredible opportunities right on our campus. About 50% of our students will also choose to study abroad, to immerse themselves in another culture, to take advantage of that experience. That most commonly happens during the junior year at Boston College, and there are a lot of great supports through our Office of Global Education to go through that process, to apply to those programs, to get any travel documentation that you might need. So there are certainly opportunities there. And internships are a plenty, right? I think internships have grown in popularity across the board and certainly being located right outside the city of Boston. There are so many opportunities. Uh, as a Bostonian myself, I often lose sight and take for granted uh, <laughs> just how much there is going on here, right? I'm so accustomed to this as normalcy, but it's an incredibly innovative city in STEM, in healthcare, in tech, in finance. There are so many opportunities in education, right? We're a leading education city <laughs> in the country. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities for our students to engage in internships locally, but our Career Center will also help our students find internships at home or abroad in different places. If you're interested in going home for the summer, spending time with your family and getting internship experience, that's certainly an opportunity that's available to you as well. Well, it definitely sounds like there's something for everyone, both on your campus and beyond. Again, being located in the beautiful city of Boston offers a wealth of opportunities. So in terms of that, what advice do you have for students and parents when it comes to visiting the Boston College campus or attending virtual information sessions? And do you track such things, Amy, as part of your overall application process? Great question. I always recommend if you are able to visit a campus, there is nothing quite like being able to put your feet on the ground, to have a sense of that community. I know that it's not always an opportunity to visit campuses with different resources, but also just life. You have a lot going on. I know each and every one of you has a busy schedule, <laughs> even over the summers. Um, so if you can't visit, there are certainly virtual opportunities as well. At Boston College, we're incredibly student-centered in our approach. And so if you visit our campus, you'll receive a panel that's really a question and answer with our students. And if you attend a virtual information session, you're going to get the same experience, right? We want to make sure you have a chance to talk to our students who live these experiences every single day, people that you might be able to resonate with, that you can ask questions that are pertinent to you um, and your experiences and what you're looking for in your college process. We'll have some virtual information sessions throughout the summer, and we have great opportunities to engage with us virtually in the fall as well. We actually have opportunities for Eagle for a discussion. So one-on-one -on -one conversations with a current student, not even a question and answer in a full group portion, getting to talk about the things that you're most interested in. And we try to match students based on their interests and their registration form as well. And I would say for us, we don't track demonstrated interest, right? So some schools will track if you've visited or if you've engaged with them in a variety of ways. Our goal is that if you are engaging with us, whether that's exchanging emails with myself or one of my colleagues, talking to us on the phone, coming to a tour, coming up to say hello at a college fair, we want that to be for you, right? This is your college search process and your research that you're doing. We do not want you to feel the pressure of having to impress us through this process. We want you to be able to be authentically who you are and ask us your questions and gather the information you need to make your decision on whether you'd like to apply or whether you'd like to attend. So we won't track any demonstrated interest. We're always happy to hear from you, but don't feel like, oh, I have to reach out and make sure they know that I'm still interested. We figure if you're applying, you're interested. Um, so please make sure that if you're engaging, it's meaningful to you because for us, that's really what it's all about. Well, that's great insight. And this has been a terrific conversation. Amy, before I get to the last question, I just want to ask, is there a question that I didn't ask that you wish I had or another topic that I didn't bring up that you'd like to share with us now? 
No, I think we've covered quite a bit. I think the <laughs> only thing I will kind of highlight that I probably should have brought up in our, our review process, I know we talked a little bit about essays, but Boston College does have an additional writing supplement as well. We actually just put our new supplements up on the website for the upcoming year. So while the common application doesn't open until August 1st, you might be able to get a head start on those Boston College writing supplement essays. <laughs> um, so I always just like to give a little bit of warning about that so it doesn't catch you off guard as you're kind of coming down the pike and submitting those applications. Well, thank you so much for that great advice and insight. Amy, this has been terrific. And unfortunately, it does lead us to the last question, which is, what are your top three pieces of advice that you would provide students and their parents getting ready for the college admissions process? Yes, I feel like I have so much advice of what I've learned throughout my career and throughout my own college admission process as well. Um, but number one is really stay organized. I know that we are all different. And by we, I mean schools, colleges and universities. We have different deadlines. We have different types of application processes. We have different requirements for financial aid. So figure out the schools that you're interested in and start keeping track of the different things that each of those schools is requiring. I'm a big spreadsheet girl, so if that works for you, great. If there's a different way that you stay organized, figure out what works best for you, making sure you're keeping track of all of those deadlines as it will make it feel a little bit more manageable. We talked a little bit about this as well. Be open, honest, and transparent in your conversations. Have those hard conversations, right? Um, I think it's really challenging to get to March, April and have students trying to figure out the financial component when they've already fallen in love with a school. Certainly, I know that there are going to be schools you apply to without having a full picture of what that financial aid package might look like, but having those conversations saying, all right, if we get into Boston College, this is what we're going to need in terms of financial aid to make this happen. So setting those expectations. I think this is one of the first times for many families that you have to have financial conversations with your children. Uh, and I know that can be really challenging and feel really intimidating. I will say, you know, looking back on my process, I think that is really where my dad and I transitioned from being father and daughter <laughs> to being friends, right? To really having these conversations and being able to open the door to have some of these conversations throughout life. And, you know, I really value that into my adulthood as well. So I know what's hard. I know what's challenging. You're going to cross that threshold at some time, and this is the perfect time to do it. And then let the student drive the process, right? I know that's really challenging and sometimes comes at odds with that last piece of advice I gave. Uh, <laughs> but let the student tell you what they're interested in. Let the student tell you where they might want to go and then have those conversations. And by that, I mean, don't just say, no, you can't go there or no, that's too expensive. Have the conversation of, okay, if that's something you're really interested in, these are all of the other factors that we have to think about as a family and start having those conversations about how that might work. And then this last piece of advice, I know I already gave three, but just one more. Uh, <laughs> try to have fun, right? I know that sounds so counterproductive. There's so much pressure that comes with this and there's a lot of deadlines and organizations, but this is a milestone process. We take for granted what it means to go to college, to have this higher level of education. It's so normalized, which is amazing, but I think students often forget what a huge milestone this is. And this is a really exciting experience that most students only get once, right? Unless you decide to transfer, we could talk about that at, at another time <laughs> as well. Uh, but enjoy it, right? Explore these different campuses, take pictures on your tours, like enjoy these times that you have. If you're going to different places around the country to tour schools, make some fun in there too, right? Explore, get to see different things. Um, so try to enjoy the process, even though I know it does come with a lot of stress. Well, those are tremendous pieces of advice. Amy, thank you so much for coming back. I'm so happy as I know that this conversation is going to help so many students and their parents as they navigate through the process. I know you've been back twice now, but I am going to have you back in the future. Is that okay? I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. I love having these conversations. Well, you're awesome, Amy. Thank you again for your time and expertise. We really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap.